Arthur Fleck's life is a Rubik's Cube of psychological problems, social problems, and bad luck. He needs guidance, but doesn't have a reliable mentor. He needs money, but isn't very good at fundraising. He needs counseling, but has the worst therapist money won't pay for. That's where I come in. On this episode, we will figure out the psychological part of this supervillain's problems, but even more than that, we will see that while we were busy trying to diagnose the Joker, the Joker was actually diagnosing us. Hello, I'm Will Larius, the Therapist, founder and CEO of the fictional character Mental Health Co-op, where we diagnose and treat all of your favorite characters from TV shows, movies, and video games. Hit the subscribe button to join our treatment team. So here's a joke for you. What do you get when you cross a gifted performer with gripping character writing that straddles the line between sympathetic and terrifying with a dance that's so awkward it's hypnotic? What you deserve. The role of the Joker brings out the best in the actors who've played him most of the time. And that is because this character is something of a psychological barometer. Every time you see this clown, it's like a window into American psychology. And the 2019 version of this dark mirror is probably the most interesting and disturbing yet. But first, let's break down his clinical portrait. When we meet Arthur Fleck, he has a laundry list of clinical symptoms. He has low self-esteem, lack of energy, lack of eye contact, socially atypical thoughts and behaviors, suicidal ideation with a plan and means, depressed moods, feelings of paranoia, erotomanic delusions, and a hallucination with benefits. So that's a lot of things. So let's organize them. These symptoms suggest something in the major depressive spectrum. These symptoms suggest something in the schizophrenic spectrum. And these things suggest mania. Schizophrenia, depression, and mania. Oh my. There are a good number of conditions and disorders that can produce these symptoms. But in my opinion, what we see from Arthur Fleck is something called schizoaffective disorder. Schizoaffective disorder is a big sandwich of suck made from a mood disorder and criteria A of schizophrenia. The way schizoaffective disorder is distinguished from depression or bipolar depression is when the symptoms occur. So let's look at Arthur Fleck's symptom timeline. At the beginning of the movie, Arthur shows many signs of major depressive disorder. We see the low self-esteem, a low slow speaking voice, self-report of consistently depressed mood, lack of motivation, and lack of self-preservation efforts. And according to Arthur, this was something that he had been experiencing for some time. All I have are negative thoughts. Arthur has the blues, literally. One of the many triumphs of this film is the use of lighting to add another dimension of the psychological storytelling. In the beginning of the movie, where Arthur's depression is most active, the lighting scheme is dominated with blue tones. However, early in the movie, we see subtle clues that he's not experiencing your run-of-the-mill depression. You see in the pill bottles that he's stopped taking one compound, where part of the name is actually visible. You only see Alzine, but considering context, there's a strong possibility that this is the drug, venelazine. Venelazine is an antidepressant, but it is not a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or SSRI. SSRIs are the typical go-to for psychiatrists to treat major depressive disorder. Venelazine is used, among other things, to treat treatment-resistant depression. This is significant because if the depression Arthur is experiencing is being caused by a schizophrenic spectrum disorder, SSRIs would not be effective in treating it. So that's the mood disorder. Let's get to the meat of this suck sandwich, psychosis. Now the most obvious schizophrenic thing that happens to Arthur is his interaction with his neighbor, which we know in hindsight to be a hallucination. But there are at least two other examples of criteria A of schizophrenia. Clinically speaking, delusions are false beliefs that are held in isolation of social reinforcement that a person holds despite evidence to the contrary. They are the sauce of the suck sandwich and they come in five delicious flavors. Jealousy type, persecutory type, grandiose type, somatic type, and the extra spicy erotomanic type. Erotomanic delusions are the persistent false belief that someone is so totally into you when they are in fact so totally not. And when you listen to the dialogue from the hallucination, you see that she represents Arthur's fondest fantasies, someone who affirms his belief and laughs at his jokes. So, 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 so. <laughs> Additionally, we see one other major symptom of psychosis, ideas of reference. That means the persistent false belief that random events and coincidences are signs from the universe meant specifically for the person. Listen to what he says about hearing My Name is Carnival on the radio after getting fired from his job. And the guy was singing that his name was Carnival because that's my clown name at work. For my whole life, I didn't know if I even really existed, but I do. This is psychosis. Arthur is still very sick right now, but according to his words and body language, he looks like he's feeling a lot better. Compared to when we first saw him with his therapist, he's making direct eye contact and has the courage to challenge her lack of engagement with his life story. He stands up to the office bully and is able to be creative on his feet and legitimately funny at times. I forgot to punch out. 
From his perspective, Arthur's life has never been better. He has a supportive partner, is starting a career that has promise for success, and finally has a chance to meet his long-lost father. But this brief vacation from his crushing depression is just another symptom of his underlying condition. And once again, there's a clue in the lighting that Arthur is experiencing a break from reality. When he first speaks directly to the hallucination of his neighbor, you notice the lighting has this eerie yellow tint, a lighter and happier color, but also a little surreal, almost as if cluing the viewer into the fact that what he's seeing is too good to be true. Remember this, it'll be important later. So like I said before, distinguishing schizoaffective disorder from other conditions requires a consistent timeline. We first see the hallucination the night before Arthur has his fateful encounter with the Wayne Foundation bros. We see the psychosis and lack of depression symptoms last all the way up to this moment, when he sees that his time at the comedy club was not as successful as he remembers. Later we find out that it has been at least two weeks since the subway murders. The resentment that's been building in the city for weeks seems close to exploding. This is the beginning of his mood disorder creeping back into his life with a vengeance. The psychiatric bubble bursts for Arthur at the worst possible time, when he finds out that not only he does not know his biological father, but he doesn't know his biological mother either. His mentor turns on him, his hallucination turns on him, and he descends back to his mood disorder to find it even worse than how he left it. His suicidal ideation is back. He does not appear to be sleeping, but also doesn't seem tired. He's energetic, he's goal-oriented, and more impulsive and hedonistic than he was at the beginning of the movie. These suggest that the bread on the sock sandwich is hypomania. Hypomania refers to a pathological state of elevated mood that, when coupled with clinical depression, results in bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a condition that should, and will, have an episode all on its own. But in summary, it is periods of pathologically elevated mood coupled with periods of pathologically depressed mood. The risk of suicide in people with bipolar disorder is significantly higher than for people with only depression due to higher levels of energy and behavioral impulsivity. And so, with the evidence from Arthur's self-report, symptoms, and timeline of his disorder, we can know the specific type of suck sandwich he has been dealt. We have a schizoaffective disorder bipolar type first episode with erotomanic sauce, current episode hypomanic. So, in all the analysis of Arthur's behavior and symptoms, you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned the notable amount of killing he's done in the film. And that is because, and I cannot stress this enough, the murders are not a symptom of Arthur's mental health diagnosis, even if he believes they are. According to studies, people on the schizophrenic spectrum are more likely to have been the victim of violence than the perpetrator of violence. The crimes that the Joker commits are not evidence of his mental health condition, but evidence that he's become well-adjusted to a world that is sick. In our analysis of the Dark Knight's version of this character, we described how that version of the Joker dissociated from military trauma by embodying the shadow archetype, young symbol of chaos and destruction. The Joker character has embodied the shadow archetype since his inception in the Golden Age of Comics, when he was juxtaposed with Batman's hero archetype. But what the hero and the shadow embody change relative to their day and age. In the Golden Age, defined by a confidence in the justified use of force and fear of outsiders, the Joker was a law-breaking murderer set up against a dedicated vigilante determined to fight for truth and justice. In the Silver Age, a period defined by lawmakers' fear that comics cause violence and homosexuality, <laughs> and homosexuality the Joker was an unserious jolly prankster who deviated from the button-down stoicism of masculinity of the time. In the modern age of comics, and in the film Dark Knight, the Joker tended to embody the American fears of terrorism. The shadow was that danger from somewhere else that could sneak in among us and strike at any moment, unless we were saved by the hero. The Joker has always been a window into American cultural fears, and this version of the character is no different. Like a literal shadow, it changes as we change. In this movie, the Joker is just another person in a mass of people scared and uncertain. This Joker isn't a threat from somewhere else. He's one of us because we are what we're afraid of. Arthur is locked in a system that is based off of power and exploitation. And after years of being abused, ignored, and taken advantage of, he finally gives in to the brutal rule of force that dominates Gotham and becomes this new shadow archetype. But unlike other versions of this character, there is no hero archetype. There is no right side up in this story. The hero that usually battles this archetype is just a naive little boy, locked away in a lavish estate and completely ignorant of the world that people like Arthur live in. Which finally brings us back to Chekhov's gun. Remember when we were talking about the lighting and the mental states, and that this eerie, too-good-to-be-true yellow lighting is a clue that Arthur is in a fantasy world? Well, we see that lighting one other place. We see it in the theater. As protesters and angry masses crowd outside, there's Thomas Wayne with Gotham Elite laughing away at a movie from the 20s. 
they are watching a relic from the same era that produced the golden age of comics. This movie is a refutation of the very idea of a hero archetype. The world is burning, and not only are they not saving it, they can't even be bothered to watch it burn. They're too absorbed in the glow of their own delusion of virtue and relevance. The Dark Knight was about Chaos Kampf and the epic battle between good and evil. This dark masterpiece looks at the idea of a battle between good and evil and laughs it back into the history books. Agree with our assessment? Let us know in the comments. Or leave a comment saying which fictional character you'd like us to treat here at the co-op. Subscribe and hit the notification button to keep up with our theory videos. If you'd like to see more pop culture diagnosis and analysis, click here. I'm Hilarious the Therapist. Thanks for watching.